I want to thank everybody for coming. We have an interesting uh, group here from the college and from the community and some of our students. Uh, so that's a wonderful um, example of what community college is all about, right? Yeah. And um, I wanted to, um, first of all, uh, thank a couple of people. It's part of important. <coughs> we, um, this program has been um, planned for a while, and we had a sort of a subcommittee that's worked uh, through the summer. So I wanted to thank, make sure I don't forget everybody, <laughs> as I look up, Howard Tinberg, Judy and Gary, where's Judy and Gary here somewhere? Up there, yeah. Yeah, Brown, uh, Cindy Yokin, and Kate Rose. I think that's the people in our subcommittee. Kate's way up there. <clears throat> We have an uh, advisory committee, which has about 12 or 13 people. I won't name them, but um, they've been very helpful and will continue to be. Uh, this is the, um, our Holocaust Center, which is going into our third year, I think. It could be our fourth, but I think it's the third year, right? Um, which, as I always say, came out of a course that Howard Timberg and I have been teaching for 14 years, remembering the Holocaust in literature and history and we'll be doing it again this spring. <clears throat> also, it came out of the uh, Jewish Federation of New Bedford, uh, which has a Holocaust Education Committee. Cindy Okun's a co, and Marie's here somewhere, co-directors uh, or co-something, co right? Um, <laughs> but I always want of course, thank the uh, Jewish Federation of New Bedford, because they're probably our strongest benefactors as far as funding a lot of our program. And our president. <laughs> Marty Lippman, over here on the right, yeah. president of the Federation. So we, we really thank them. Uh, the college, of course, has been um, very supportive of us. And we have individual contributions. And you've all contributed. Thank you very much. This is our first fundraiser. So um, we're very happy. It helps to bring this great program that we're, you'll be experiencing. And we have a number of other programs. We have a um, a talk on um, November 15th, Dr. Uh, Pearl, who's the Division um, Social Science Dean, she's going to be talking about uh, health people in the Holocaust, uh, contributors of the health uh, <coughs> professionals. And um, we have a whole number of programs in the spring, some scholars and uh, an artistic program. And um, we're working together with the Federation to bring a, actually a off-Broadway show, which is um, with Ed Asner, some of you may remember him, and Kate Burton. They're gonna be at the, uh, at the uh, Zyterian in January 28th, I believe. So keep an eye on that, That's a, it's called The Soap Myth. It's a play that they had on Broadway, it's now on tour, and we were fortunate to get it. Um, so lots of stuff happening. Um, and Cindy's reminding me that this Sunday at Terra of Israel, 2 o'clock, right, a man named Glenn Kurtz is going to be speaking. He wrote a book called The, um, what do you call it, Two Minutes? Three Minutes. Three Minutes, in which he discovered a, um, a very small uh, film of his, that his father had left on a trip to Poland. And then with that film of the people who were there, he ended up researching it for a couple years and wrote this book about it. Who were those folks who most of whom died during the Holocaust? So it's at 2 o'clock at Terra of Israel, Brownell Street, if you're interested. Uh, I heard him speak uh, last year, and it's really interesting. You can get his book there. <coughs> so uh, the Federation Committee does a lot of good work. Um, this last where I wanted to, she's not here, I wanted to thank uh, Linnell Dean and our volunteers uh, for all their help. We have student volunteers who make a big difference, and you met them, uh, Helen Marcus and uh, Amanda Dalton, a couple others, and of course, um, Judy and Gary Brown. So they've been, uh, we can't do it alone. I can't do it alone, and they, it makes all the difference. All right, um, <coughs> excuse me. Before we start, I wanted to introduce, uh, we have our former president, John Sprague, is sitting here on our right, thank you. 
and I want to introduce our current president, who just began in July, who will say a few words, uh, President Laura Douglas. And her husband is here. All the way from Iowa. Well, good evening and welcome to Bristol Community College. We're so thankful for your support uh, of this event and our Holocaust Center. It is just a gem on our campus. It's a wonderful way for not just our students, but our faculty, staff, and our community to remain in touch with what happened years ago, but is so critically important to our lives today and our future. And so I wanted to take a moment just to welcome you to uh, this event and to our campus. Know that you're welcome at any time. And also to give a round of applause to all that helped uh, put this event on today. So Ron and Keith. <laughs> I am brand new, about four months now, and uh, loving every moment of it. And thanks to Jack for uh, leading the way. And I look forward to getting to know uh, many of you or meeting you for the first time at the reception after this event. So enjoy the evening, and thank you again. Thank you very much, President Douglas. She's been very supportive of every one of our programs. She's been. Uh, introducing, welcoming people. And uh, I know Jack did that uh, as he was president. So we obviously appreciate the support of the college. We're located, by the way, on the second floor of the library. And we have a collection, I would want, of about 600 books that we are happy to lend out. So if you're around, please come up the second floor and um, look around at our collection. Uh, and um, we also have a number of other things. We're hoping to expand at some point, because we're running out of room, but it's really a nice room as it is. So please come up if you're around the campus. Um, so um, with all that, I'm very happy to be able to introduce Dr. Lawrence Langer, who is going to be our main speaker today. Um, Dr. Langer, who is a professor emeritus at Simmons College, is a pioneer in the uh, literature of the Holocaust. He is the person who really started, back in the 60s, the whole field of Holocaust literature. Um, the field of, lit of uh, Holocaust historiography and literature is relatively new. It really got, I mean, it seems relatively new, maybe from my, <laughs> but uh, it's really started in the 60s and 70s. And um, it's continually expanded. As I said, we have the, the amount of books that are on that subject in a variety of ways is amazing. But in any case, Dr. Langer is a pioneer in this area. Uh, we use, Howard Timberg and I use his book, uh, Art from the Ashes, which is an amazing anthology. We've used it for almost the whole time, I think, right? Uh, but he's also written many other books. He's writing a book now uh, since he's retired, which has been a few years, but he's uh, been very active in the field actually giving a keynote speech at the University of Virginia on Monday. So we're lucky to get him. And um, he's written, uh, there's nine books on uh, nine collections of the art of Samuel Back. He'll be talking about that. And he's written a commentary for all nine books. And you'll see the commentary all around when you go to the gallery. So the way we'll proceed now is that we'll have a talk and then a little question and answer. We'll go then to the gallery and have some food and do some music, and then we will, um, you can see the art. So, Dr. Langer. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Ron, for the invitation, and thank you for coming. Um, if the Red Sox were playing in the World Series today, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I've lost interest. For, uh, um, let me tell you just a little bit about Sam Bach before I show you some of the paintings. I'm not going to be talking about the paintings in the gallery because my commentary on the paintings are posted next to the paintings and whatever I would say would be repetitious or redundant. I'm going to show you a group of paintings from a volume we did some years ago called Return to Vilna. Sam was born in Vilna. It was in Poland when he was born. Later on became the capital of Lithuania. And Coincidentally, because I'm talking about the paintings from Return to Vilna, this week Sam is leaving for Vilna 
Uh, Lithuania is going to make him an honorary citizen of Lithuania. Um, he and his gallery have donated 50 of his paintings to the Jewish Museum in Vilna, which will be opening up. And so he still feels a connection to the country, in spite of what happened to his family there. <clears throat> he was born in 1933, and last August that would make him 84. He's a prodigiously prolific painter. He started painting when he was 12 or 13. I don't have time to show you some of his early works, but works he did when he was 13, 14, and 15 are remarkable. Um, <clears throat> in fact, he won his first art prize for a painting he submitted to an art exhibit in the Vilna Ghetto. He was discovered as a painter by Avraham Sutskeva, who was the greatest of Yiddish poets in the 20th century and a survivor of the Vilna Ghetto, who died just a few years ago in Jerusalem at the age of 96. Um, Sam and his family were in the Vilna Ghetto. His four grandparents were taken, and I'll talk more about that later, to a suburb of Vilna where the Germans had prepared mass graves and they were shot. Uh, 93% of Lithuanian Jews were murdered by the Germans, a higher percentage than any other country in Western Europe. Um, his father was lucky enough to get a job working in a factory outside of Vilna, um, working on trucks that the Germans were repairing. And because he had a permit to work there, he was allowed to bring his wife and his son. Sam is an only child. And while his father worked during the day, Sam hid under a bunk. Because one day, the Germans rounded up all the children of families working in the um, factory, took them down to the suburb of Vilna and shot them. Sam's father told him to crawl under the bunk and to stay there all day long. And that's where he hid every day. Uh, somehow they were able to bribe a Lithuanian guard to let the mother leave. There was no wall or fence around this factory. Uh, his mother had a great aunt who was born Jewish to a rabbi who had 20 children, and they couldn't take care of all of them. And so the great aunt was given to a Christian family and raised as a Christian who was living in Vilna as a Christian. And she sent her maid to the vicinity of the factory and one evening strolled out, wasn't seen, and she escaped. Then they made plans to do the same thing with Sam. At this point, now the Germans, when the Germans invaded Lithuania, Poland, Lithuania, Sam would have been eight years old. His father was working in the factory, he was 10. He is slight and was short. His father's job at that particular time was to carry sacks of wood, um, which the Germans were using to run the trucks because they had no source of oil or gasoline anymore. And Sam's father said to him, tomorrow morning I'm going to put you in the sack instead of the wood, and we're going to walk through this factory, and there's a window on the right side, and I'm going to drop you out the window, and you're going to climb out of the sack maid, whose name I've forgotten, is going to be standing over there. And you just walk over there as if you're just walking around, which is exactly what he did. Fell out the window, which was at ground level. And the maid took his hand. And that's how Sam survived. Three days before the Russians arrived to liberate Vilna, the Germans shot his father. So he lost his four grandparents, his father, aunts, uncles, cousins, you know, large group. Uh, he and his mother were hidden um, until the Russians arrived, and they survived. They finally made their way to Germany, where they stayed in a displaced persons camp for two or three years, where Sam continued to paint. Um, he turned 13 in the DP camp, and his mother said, Shmuel, his name is Samuel, but his Yiddish name was Shmuel, it's time for the bar mitzvah. And Sam said, He's very independent. He says, are you crazy after what they did to my 
father and grandparents, and God did nothing to intervene. You expect me to bar mitzvah, be bar mitzvah, and so he refused. And yet, you'll see in his paintings, he is very learned in Yiddish and Jewish culture. Themes in his paintings are almost, not always, but almost always related to the fate of the Jews during the Holocaust. Um, he just, and he said to me, you know, I don't have faith anymore. He says, if I'm wrong, am I going to be sorry? Uh, he's not the only one who says that, I guess. Now, he paints between 50 and 100 paintings every year. It sounds impossible. I mean, it's impossible to me. It takes me a couple of years to write a book. And in a year, and um, when he finishes the paintings, I go over to his studio. We've just moved to new quarters, which I won't go into. They're 1.2 miles from Sam, four minutes to drive to his house from our house. So when he's finished, he calls me, and I go over to his studio, and he puts each painting on an easel. And when there are 100 paintings, I can't leave until I've watched each one. And sometimes we talk. I never say to Sam, him, Sam, what does this mean? I once, at one of the, twice a year, he has an exhibition of his new paintings in, his, in the gallery, the Pucker Gallery. And once we were there at the exhibition, and he, there's a painting of three elderly men. One of them had a long beard. And I said, Sam, is he supposed to be Jewish? Took me by the shoulder and brought me up to the painting. He says, why don't we ask him? <laughs> Never ask him another question about <laughs> what does this mean. He doesn't know. I lecture widely on him all over the country. And uh, a couple of times I've given a lecture, and I see Sam is in the audience. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> and when I'm finished, you know, we open for questions. No one ever asks me a question. They all ask Sam questions because the artist is there. And Sam keeps saying, why are you asking me? I don't know what this is all about. Ask him. He's the expert. <laughs> We've done nine volumes together. Now, I'm sorry there are none down there. You should try to get some of them down there. The Pucker Gallery has them all. They're published as books. He does between 50 and 100 paintings. And I write a long interpretive essay of 40 or 50 pages. And the volumes are published. And he is just quite amazing. Now. He doesn't like to be called a Holocaust painter. He prefers to be called a painter of the modern dilemma. What's the modern dilemma for him? Uh, the Holocaust for him is the major catastrophe of our time. There have been other catastrophes, as you know. And um, we're living in, for him, and you'll see from the imagery and the paintings I'm going to show you, a permanently damaged world not only physically damaged, mentally damaged, culturally damaged. And he will do paintings of walls, still lifes of wine bottles and vases. They all have cracks. They're half broken. It's a half crumbled world, but never a totally crumbled world. Um, he wants to enable us to imagine a world that was destroyed and was not renewed, but went on. Jewish life was destroyed in Central Europe forever. There are no shtetls anymore. There's no cheda anymore. He knows that. And life has gone on. And he's tried to find a way of enabling us to visualize what was lost and what remains, and how to live in a world with the knowledge that this loss will never be regained or renewed, and yet life goes on. And we live in what I call both the afterlife and the after-death of the Holocaust. What is the after-death of the Holocaust? I watch a lot of survivor testimonies. I do a lot of survivor interviews. And from time to time, I hear a survivor saying things like this. There's literal quotes. I died in Auschwitz, but no one sees it or a woman who survived Bergen-Belsen and writes in her diary, we have survived, but we are dead. And it's a contradiction. I mean, if you survived, you're not dead. And I said to myself, how can you be dead and alive at the same time? And that's one of the legacies of the Holocaust. I once interviewed a man who came in. They don't have many, but they used to have these rolls of papers in which you used to take notes. 
And he came in with them, rolled around his finger, and he unrolled it. He said, last night I wrote down the names of 35 immediate members, members of my immediate family who were murdered by the Germans. And that's what I mean by the after death of the Holocaust. It's like the parents in Newtown, Connecticut, who have to think every day about the kindergarten children with riddled bullets. You don't get over that. Sam never got over it. It didn't stop living. He has a beautiful house, gorgeous swimming pool behind. He's never invited us to swim in his swimming pool. <laughs> Um, and I've never asked him why, but <laughs> since now we only live a mile from where he lives. But um, he's gone on with his life, but you'll see from his art that the death has gone on with him at the same time. And that's one of the paradoxes and dilemmas of the Holocaust. The pretense that you can recover from this is an illusion. People talk about it, principally, forgive me, psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, but Survivors are not patients, and Sam is not a patient. Uh, he doesn't suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. He and his wife live a very happy life. They're lovely people. But he has this kind of legacy and burden of what happened to his grandparents and what happened to his father. And you just don't escape from that. And that's part of the themes of his paintings. All right, now, I'm going to show you some of the paintings, and I hope we can have a little dialogue afterwards. These are just eight paintings couple of things to say about a Bach painting. You cannot look at a Bach painting and say, oh yes, I understand what this is all about. It is about something. If you ask him, he will say, how should I know I just paint them? <laughs> and he's not joking, he's serious. He, he paints the images. Um, you have to learn not to say, what answers are these paintings giving us? You have to say, what questions are these paintings asking us? And in order to do that, you have to look very carefully at it. You have to look at it until you begin to see. What does seeing mean? Well, this is called ghetto. It's theme is Jewish because there's a Jewish star. Can you, is the arrow above that? Yeah. So you can see that, there's a Jewish star. Now, not only a Jewish star, this is Sam's version of the rain, remains of the Vilna ghetto. How do we know that? I know it because he told me, otherwise I wouldn't know. <laughs> this is a Hebrew letter Vod. This is a Hebrew letter Gimel, VG for Vilna ghetto. It's one of the signatures of many of his paintings. There's no way anyone will know that, but it's there. And if you happen to know the Hebrew alphabet, you might detect it. All right, what are we supposed to be looking at? Well, he tells us <coughs> this star points, and I'll talk about this in a minute, right into the heart. It's called ghetto, it's Vilna ghetto, and in order to get there, you have to do some excavating. As, just as when you look at the painting, you have to do some excavating. Now. If you want to avoid it, you simply take these huge slabs and push them back over the surface. You don't even have to think about it. Uh, but that's not what he wants us to do. He wants us to learn how to uncover some of the realities of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And to uncover that, you have to push these slabs back. Now, you have to look carefully to see that this is a six-pointed star. One is in here, you can't see it, but there are six points to it. You don't see that immediately, mm -hmm. but What's buried under there is the fate of the Jewish people. Now, it's almost impossible. If you look at the real painting, which I have, this is just a reproduction, there's a faint red glow in there of fire. Jewish people went up in smoke in the camps. They were burned in crematoria. What happened to the Vilna ghetto? It was destroyed. Its people were sent uh, to be shot at mass graves. And so he paints facades with blank windows, like blind eyes, staring at you. Um, one of the things he's master at is, been, this is a concept that's at first difficult to understand, painting the presence of absence. There are no people. Where are the people? You have to ask yourself, what happened to the people? Well, if you follow this little journey into here, you realize that the people went on a journey toward their death. 
one of the things Sam's tries to do in painting after painting is to enable us to see that there is no longer just one narrative of the Jewish people escaped from Egypt under divine guidance being led to the promised land. There's now another narrative in the post-Holocaust era of a reverse journey from the promised land back into the realm of destruction. And that's what I mean when I said there's both an afterlife and an after death of the Holocaust. For him, that's a paradox. Uh, in many of his paintings, not in these, he has versions of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. And if you remember that story from Genesis, um, God says to Abraham, because thou hast done this for me, I will multiply thy seed as the stars in the heavens and the sands on the shores of the sea. A promise leading, leading eventually to the covenant. And there's nothing wrong with that. But for Sam, because of the Holocaust, there are now two stories, one of multiplication and one of subtraction. <coughs> In other words, the multiplication of your seed. And Sam says, well, what happened to that journey and why, it was, why was it reversed? And how do I, as a descendant of Jews, his great-grandfather was a rabbi, uh, how do I explain that contradiction between the covenantal promise and the fate of the Jews in the Holocaust? I just asked a question. His paintings asked that question. If you ask me how do I answer that, I have no idea. What he wants us to do is to allow that paradox to enter into consciousness and to think about it. All right, now, so this is called Blind Alley. Again, the title it's in. Now, I don't know where he gets his titles from. He gives a different title to every one of his paintings. He's done thousands of them. And so you can't ignore his titles. Um, this in also involves a kind of seeing, looking and seeing. Here, too, the presence of animals. <laughs> there was a Jewish community once. There's the remains of the synagogue. I'll talk about this later. Uh, he uh, is fond of painting the shape of the Ten Commandments, the twin tablets, but they're invariably empty. Um, the covenantal promise has been at least damaged by the fate of the Jews in the Holocaust. There were no people. They took a journey down through here under that arch. And I was going to say, we don't know what happened to them in the painting. But you and I know what happened to them. What's left? Again, a community. Now, many of you will know the city of Vilna was called the Jerusalem of Lithuania. It had one of the most famous Jewish Yiddish libraries in Europe, the Strachan Library, most of which the Germans destroyed although some of the books were hidden. And I just read two days ago that in the basement of a church in Vilna, in the room that no one ever looked in, they found thousands and thousands of documents hidden there by the Jews uh, during the Holocaust. And no one knew they were there. And now they're going through them to see what's there. So what's left? The people are gone. But the culture is not yet dead. All these volumes are still here. They're covered by, are they shrouds? Again, a question, I'm not sure. You can call them sheets if you will, I call them shrouds. Uh, little by little, the culture has been destroyed, but not entirely. You see the remnants of these volumes. The people are represented by the books that their ancestors have written. Now, it's hard to see this. Let's see if we can see it here. Yeah. Yes, right there. We don't know what's under there. I said there is no people. Is that a corpse under there? We don't know. Is that a winding sheet? We don't know. Little drops of blood right there, scarcely noticeable unless you look carefully. So some kind of violence has taken place. We're not sure what. Now, another thing Sam does is he lets his paintings kind of enter into dialogue with each other. If you look at the next painting, which is called Persistence, Now, here, was this a synagogue, or was this just a, what they called a shtubel, where the Orthodox Jews went to study? Is it part of a cheder, where young Jewish children were taught the beginning of uh, biblical lore? You see here that the Ten Commandments, you see the arches right there, which are empty. 
but the Ten Commandments are right there with the first ten letters of the Hebrew alphabet lightly written on them. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vov, Zion, Ches, Ches, Yud. Uh, one of the questions that I mentioned earlier, he's possessed by is the question of what happened to those Ten Commandments, the sixth of which. He doesn't in these paintings, many paintings, you'll see the number six. Why the number six? The sixth commandment is lo tzitzach, do not murder. Uh, and we all know what the number six also represents, six million Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust. What's the relationship between the commandment not to murder and the fact that six million Jews were murdered? Again, if you ask me the answer for the answer to that, I don't know the answer. But I know the question. And that's what he wants us to ponder. Here you see the remnants of the library. This is called persistence. The authors of these books are dead. The people who read this, studied these books are dead, but the books remain. Some of the books have been destroyed. The leaves are scattered all over the landscape. Uh, all that remains is the memory of a culture. What do we do with our memory of that culture? How do we keep it alive? And of course, that's happened. I mean, the, the Germans won a partial victory. They destroyed two-thirds of European Jewelry, but Jewish thought, Jewish philosophy, Jewish culture continues to go on. The next one is called Ponari. Ponari was a suburb outside of Vilna where something like 130,000 Jews from Vilna were taken to mass graves and buried in the mass graves. Uh, an issue I can't talk about now, it's something I've written about, is that in recent years there have been discoveries to prove that many of the people who were shot and pushed into the graves were not killed but only wounded and were buried alive. It's very difficult to even mention that, to say nothing of thinking about it, because it's one of the real horror truths of the Holocaust. Uh, so. You go to Panari today, and Sam went back to Panari, the site where his, uh, the remains of his grandparents and his father were. After a certain point, the Germans had the remnants of the corpses dug up and they burned them. They had this, to me, crazy notion that if they could make the remains of the victims of their crime disappear, no one will ever know what they did, which, of course, is a crazy notion. They planted trees there, and if you go there today, there's a wooded grove. And there's a small monument, I'll talk about that in a minute. And so Sam says, suppose we take away those trees. That are, It's another form of excavation or uncovering of a truth of the Holocaust. And let's send them somewhere. Notice how this blocks the horizon, it blocks the vista or the view, and it forces our eyes down here. And what are we looking at? An exposed cemetery of the dead. That's the truth of Panari, although you don't see it if you go there today. And I think when Sam went there, he thought, you know, what I'm looking at is not showing me what really happened here. So we have to exercise the imagination. You see little tombstones rising up. Once again, in the presence of absence of no people, we haven't yet seen a single human being and in the eight paintings I'm showing you, I don't think we will see a simple human being. But one of the uh, major atrocities of the Holocaust is that the human beings have disappeared. The Germans were doing their best not only to kill them, but to wipe off any presence of them from the earth. And so we gaze at this landscape, and we don't see very much because he wants our eyes to be directed down here. You'll see in a few minutes, I'll show you a companion painting, which enters into dialogue with this one. Very similar imagery, but we are forced to see it in a different way. Some people think he repeats himself, but you know there are many paintings of haystacks in France by the same painter, or um, pools of lilies. I can't remember what it was actually called. <laughs> but, uh, and they're not the same. The light is different. The perspective is different. He wants us to understand that it's not one way of looking at this, 
There are many ways of looking at this. The sun is shining. How can the sun shine on a site like that? One of the themes that Sam persists in visualizing is the paradox that nature seems to have been untouched by what happened. I once saw an interview with one woman who survived the Holocaust. The rest of the family was wiped out. And she and her sister went back to the village they were born in, hoping to find some relative. And she says, it was spring. And we approached the village, and the apple trees were in blossom. And it was beautiful. And we stood there, and we said, the trees have no notion of what happened. They're still producing blossoms, as if nothing happened. But nature is not sentient. We are. So nature is not conscious of what happened. So we said, let's just saw off these trees and get them out of the way, and we can see what lies beneath. Here is the candle. Shabbat, the candle, light the candle of Sabbath. He, po is up here, and Nair is down there. Through some bizarre coincidence, the letters of Pona, where the Jews of Vilna were murdered, are the same letters of Pona. Extraordinary coincidence. Here again, our eyesight is directed down. Now, this is a monument. There is a monument on the grounds of Ponari. How do you build a monument? Another question without an answer. To memorialize the murder of 130,000 Jews from the city of Vilna. So Sam makes his best effort, but look how rickety it is. He says, there's no way you can build a celebratory monument when what's being memorialized is the murder of the Jews. So he has it rickety. It's barely held together. By, and it's leaning. Uh, and there's a kind of metal brace there to keep it from toppling over. And there's actually a candle down here. And there's even a flame in the candle. But it's in stone. In other words, there's nothing living there. Now, he does something even more extraordinary, which I think is wonderful in this painting. There's a painting within a painting. This is a painting of, like the painting we just saw, Bonari, of the trees leaving. Why is it there? Well, it's to remind us that we're looking at a painting. This is a painting, but this is a painting too. This is a painting of a painting, but this, this is not the reality. This is only a painting. It's an effort to recapture visually a truth in history which cannot really be captured visually. And a way of reminding us of that, us of that is to reminding us that we're really looking at a painting, not at what really happened. There's the remains of the Vilna ghetto, the facades of the house. And here's some more remains of facades of house with no people living in them. Uh, it seems as if all these trees are intact. But if you look right here, this tree seems to be resting on the stage here rather than in the ground. It's very hard to see or determine if that's correct. Um, when he says, here is the candle, he raises another question. You all, well, many of you will know about yard side candles, which you light in memory of the departed in our family uh, with a real flame. Um, one of the things the, que the painting asks is, how do you find an adequate memorial for what happened here? And one answer is, there is no adequate memorial for what happened here. How do you think about what happened here? And one answer is, there's no way of thinking about what happened here. But we think about what happened here anyway. We make an effort to do it. Look as carefully as you can, this arrow says. In some way, excavate or reconstruct what happened to the Jews of Milna. Well, you're never going to really know what happened unless you were there. But at least you can imagine. And that's what one thing his off literature can do, a similar thing. But that's one thing art can do. By making such a complex vision of the scene at Ponari, he forces us to try to conjure up in our imagination a scenario that happened a long time ago. The next two are the most terrifying paintings I think he's ever done. At least, I don't know how you can tell me later how you feel about it. But this is how I feel about it. And I like to 
If this were a normal scene, you would call it nap time in the nursery. But it's not a normal scene. These are teddy bears lying on their blankets. This is all, although people have said to me, why does he have a pig here? It's not kosher, but not a pig. It's a grown up teddy bear kind of supervising all the others. These are dead teddy bears. One of them is blindfolded. One of them is under a shroud. One of them seems just spread out in death. Two of them there. <coughs> Some of them are dismembered. There's no way he could paint corpses of children murdered in the Holocaust, although there are one and a half million of them. Uh, if one has any doubt about what we're looking at, you look at the pile here. One of the things Sam likes to do is to, in a sense, paint off the, camp uh, the canvas, not literally because there's nothing there, but to take our eyes away and say, what else is there? We're not sure what this is. It looks like a pile of stones, but it might be a pile of teddy bears. Why teddy bears? He's trying to evoke the fate of childhood. I still remember my teddy bear. It was green, furry, and it had one brown eye and one eye missing. And every time, well, you'll see in the next painting, when I look at a teddy bear missing an eye, I think about my teddy bear. I love to take it to bed with me. I love to hold it. One of the favorite belongings of children. Again, the presence of absence. We have the teddy bears, but their owners are gone. And Sam is not asking us to pity the poor fate of teddy bears. He's asking us to remember the fate of the children. And one way of doing that is to look at a scene like this. Now, this is a group kind of portrait. But, and groups were shot at mass graves. But every group consisted of single individuals. And one thing, one thing that Sam wants to do is to ask us to think of individuals as well as groups. And so he has a painting called a Small Memorial, a single teddy bear. You notice that there are no eyes anymore. What do the eyes look like? They look like this, a bullet hole. These children were shot. Now, this is full of complex imagery. First of all, there's a vov. And there's a Gimel. He's still talking about the Vilna Ghetto, VG. Half of the Star of David, so clearly he's talking about the fate of the Jews. He has certain items from childhood, a soccer ball. They don't do it anymore, but when children behave like children, instead of looking at their iPhones, they used to take a stick and they used to push hoops down the street to keep them rolling without falling over. Innocent game. But there's something more there. This is a one, and this is a zero. And there were 10 commandments, and they used to be in this area. You see half of it here and half of it here. The tables of the law, which have now disappeared. One of the questions Sam asks himself in many paintings is that if we had to write the 10 commandments today, or scripture? How would we include the history of the Holocaust as part of Jewish tradition and Jewish legacy? Another question for which I have no answer. He has no answer. But he reminds us about an absence from Scripture, an absence from the Ten Commandments, a failing, perhaps, of the Ten Commandments, when um, the scenario is one of violence rather than faith and divine guidance. Again, he has a candle. Weeping tears of wax, I sometimes like to think, that are dripping down. It's not real wax. Again, it turns to stone. He's a master at painting stone and brick. Why? Again, I have some possible answers. I don't have the answer. But stone and brick are inert and lifeless. Stone doesn't grow. You can't plant stone or brick and watch it you know, flourish. They're inert matter. And in a world where the human beings have disappeared, we're left only with inert matter. Brick and stone, of course, were common images in the Holocaust. The wall around the Warsaw Ghetto, the brick and stone of the crematorium and the gas chambers. Uh, it's a common, common visual spectacle in Sam's paintings. Uh, the teddy bear now is partially dismembered. 
Um, the fate of childhood is now represented by the teddy bear. A little, little wisp of smoke in there. Sam likes to paint smoke, usually coming out of a chimney. Here it's coming out of the smoke from the candle. We know what the smoke represents because the Jews in the death camps, once they were put in the crematorium, went up in smoke. It's a common statement of prisoners in the camps. When new arrivals came and said, when are we going to see our family again, the old prisoners would say, there's your family, they're going up in smoke. <coughs> um, now, there's one last one, and that's really in dialogue with Ponari, which you saw before. This is called Under the Trees. Here he's opened up the vista and the panorama. So if you really see the expanded extent of the tombstones rising up from the earth like I once wrote, like accusatory fingers pointing to heaven. That's my own locution. Whether that's what he meant or not, I don't know. Uh, and if you ask him, he would say, come, let's ask the stones what they're doing. So I don't ask them. Um, but these are no longer blocking the panorama. You can see nature. And many of these trees are not sawn off. They're just uprooted. Where are they going? Well, they're exposing what lies underneath the fate of the Jews of his beloved Vilna, the city of his birth. Maybe they're flying somewhere else to reroute themselves. In other words, somehow life will go on somewhere but it will be a transplanted life. And of course, that's his fate. He went from Vilna to a displaced person camp in Germany. Then they emigrated to Palestine, to Israel, 1948, where he went to high school, was in the army, first went to art school. Then he went to Paris to study at the uh, Ecole des Beaux-Arts. Then he went to Italy to study. Then he went to Switzerland to study, paint more, went back to Israel, uh, and finally ended up in New York and then outside of Boston. So he's had a transplanted life himself. And of course, it's the fate of European Jewry to have a transplanted life. Very few Jews <coughs> remained in Europe, as you know. They went either to America or to Israel. Some went to Australia, some went to South America, but most of them immigrated to America or Israel in a new place. And so the possibility of going on with your life, I think, is represented by the trees. But you carry with you, as you leave, the memory and the burden of what happened to those not lucky enough to survive. And that's the twin paradox with which he continues to live his life today. He gets up 6 in the morning, he paints all day, 6 days a week, and can't stop. And he said to me, as long as my mind uh, is filled with images, I'll put my brush on canvas and continue to paint. It's quite a remarkable life story. And I didn't mention you, each of the paintings I've showed you is five feet by six feet. They're enormous paintings. They're very large. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. We're going to be moving into galleries soon, but maybe I've got five minutes or so we have a little dialogue. Even ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any questions. Yes? Where are the paintings? Where are these paintings? Yeah. All over. Um, when he finished his series of paintings, his gallery, the Pucker Gallery in Boston, which if you're ever in Boston, you should certainly visit, on Newberry Street in Boston. And they have many of his paintings hanging in the gallery. They're all for sale. A number of them are bought, the rest are stored. I mean, when you paint three, 4,000 paintings in your life, which he's done, you don't sell all of them. And so uh, some of them were sponsored by um, clients. And so the clients then own them. Some of them are stored in the Pocket Gallery has a warehouse. Sam has many of them hanging in his house and stored in his house. And uh, the answer is, I don't know where they all are. Uh, some are in museums in Europe. Very few are in museums in this country. I'll never understand why museums in this country 
are not interested. Many of them are in Israel, but some are in Germany, some are in France. <coughs> Many of them are privately owned. The Pucker Gallery has a list of clients who are really devotees of Sam's work. And twice a year, they have an exhibit and a private dinner, which I have the privilege of always being invited to. I never buy the paintings. Paintings like these sell for about $100,000. Smaller paintings, two by three feet, sell for about 30000 Every time I do a volume with him, he does a painting for me. So I now have nine of his paintings. I probably have the largest private collection, other than Sam himself and, and Bernie Pucker of the Pucker Gallery. And for my 70th birthday, he had a drawing for me of the boy from the Warsaw Ghetto with his hands raised. And he made a beautiful frame out of cherry wood. He said his parents' furniture was all made of cherry wood. And so he got some cherry wood and made a frame. And my wife had a 70th birthday. He did the same thing for her, he did a drawing for her. And I cherish them. Yes? He's such a prolific painter. I'm sorry, I can't. Have, does he have assistants? Or he does it all? Oh, by? all himself. He has an assistant who catalogs his paintings and, and uh, puts them on computers. When I first thought, when I was first asked to do the first volume in 1995, I can't imagine how primitive things were in 1995, <laughs> the gallery gave me a light table with transparencies of the paintings. You know what a light table is? <laughs> you turn a switch and the light comes out, and then you put the transparent. That's no way to look at paintings, but that's all that was available. Um, and so that's how I began working. But uh, um, now he puts them all. He himself does his paintings by himself. He, I've been in the studio many times. It's in a loft with uh, light coming in through the ceiling. And sometimes he goes around and does a number of paintings at the same time. Different, well, I'm not insulting you, but the difference between me and you and Sam is that he's a genius. Okay, I'm not. Maybe some of you are. But, uh, and, uh, uh, he does it, no assistant, all by himself. Yes? Um, did his mother follow him to the United do, States? I say it louder. I'm sorry, did his mother follow him to the United States and did she live a long life? Uh, his mother followed him to the United States. No, she died of cancer and she was not that old. Maybe in her 60s, I'm not sure. She remarried. In fact, she, she remarried the director of the displaced persons camp in Germany. And Sam was very fond of his stepfather. He died early also. Yes? For about 30 years after the end of World War II, you, you couldn't have had this discussion. After the, For about 30 years after the end of World War II, this discussion could not have taken place. The Holocaust was not spoken about. There were, uh, it was not in history books. Uh, and suddenly, in the mid-1970s, all of a sudden, it became a cause. It became people, the survivors, who would not speak about it, all of a sudden, in the mid-1970s, opened up. The survivors started to tell their story. I mean no ill will, and forgive me for contradicting you, but you're wrong. <laughs> I taught the first course in the United States on Holocaust literature in 1965. I wrote my first book called The Holocaust and the Literary Imagination in 1968. Raoul Hilberg wrote the first seminal work called The Disruption of European Jewry in 1961. So it's not true that, and there's a long string of very important books being written long before 1975. Now, what you're saying is a common belief, but it's not a common truth. It's also not true that they couldn't talk about it. Because I've interviewed by it wasn't now. that they couldn't, they wouldn't. That's also not true. I've interviewed 84 survivors, and almost without exception, they told me when they came over to the United States, they tried to tell people about what happened and one of them said, they said to me, we suffered too. Sugar was rationed, butter was rationed. <laughs> and honest, that's what they told me. They said, I clammed up, they said. No one wanted to hear. 
It's not that they didn't want to talk about it. It's that they had no audience. It wasn't until the 1970s, there you're correct, that an audience was available and finally willing to listen. The first large-scale interviewing um, campaign at the Fortunoff Archives at Yale University began in 1979. Uh, so not because they couldn't talk before then, but because no one was willing to interview them before then. The Eichmann trial was in 1961. It was televised in this country. Lots of people watched it. That was a worldwide phenomenon. So it was available. It's not the survivors who didn't want to talk about it. It's the people who didn't want to hear about it for a variety of reasons. Principle one of which was it was so terrible that it was too painful to listen to. Do you want to pray? I was going to ask the continue as to why, what transitioned in that decade that changed that sentiment. You mean what people were willing to listen? Right. Well, um, what happened at the video archive at Yale, a survivor sponsored two other people willing to do interviews. They put an ad in the New Haven Register, which is where Yale is, saying we have a new program to interview survivor, Holocaust survivors. If you're willing to be interviewed, please contact us. They came crawling out of the world, uh, from the walls from every direction. They now have 4,400 interviews. Mm -hmm. Shoah Foundation has 27,000 interviews in English alone, not counting the other. Uh, they wanted to talk, but no one invited them. Now, that's in this country. They started interviewing survivors in the, the Jewish Historical Institute in um, Poland, started interviewing survivors in 1945, as soon as the war ended. Yad Vashem, maybe in the 60s, started interviewing in Hebrew, in Yiddish, in Polish. People in this country, of course, scholars couldn't read that at that time. So it came to this country later. But in Europe, interviews, uh, an American psychology professor went to Europe in 1946 with what was called a wire recorder. I have no idea how wire recorders worked. Very primitive. And he started interviewing survivors who had got out of the camp three months ago, two months ago. The problem with that was that the psychology professor didn't know anything about the Holocaust. Now, you can't blame him. It was 1945. Nobody knew anything about the Holocaust in 1945. So he interviewed one woman. He says, when I was sent to Auschwitz, and he actually said, Auschwitz, what was that? In 1945. Auschwitz was in Poland. The Soviets liberated Auschwitz. They didn't let any Western reporters there. It took years for us to understand the gassing process. I visited Auschwitz in 1964, and I walked from the main camp to what was called Auschwitz-Birkenau, which where the killing facilities, where they were blown up by the Germans before they left. And I was the only person there. And there was a plaque, 1964, saying, on this site, four million victims of fascism were murdered. And that figure, four million, persisted. This is, this is already 19 years after the war. It persisted for another 10 years until the demographers began doing some figuring out and said, that's impossible. Uh, and Raoul Hilberg began tracking the, tra the trains and how many people are on each train. We now know that 1,100,000 people were killed at Auschwitz, 950,000 were Jews, the rest were Poles and Gypsies and Soviet prisoners of war. Who knows where that figure 4 million came from? But 25 years after the war, that was still the figure that people were using because we didn't have the detail. I have one, one more question. That, well, it doesn't feel, I, I, think I was just going to say, also the art site book came out in the 50s, that they began to trickle out the art site, the memorial books of the survivors started yeah. to trickle. And I know when, when the art site book came into our family, it changed the atmosphere. I mean, you see, my family came in the 20s, and the art site book brought with it all the, the, the tragedies and, and the people, their, their family that was killed. It had such I still have it, like, but it, it, it had such a power. And that, I believe it was published in 52. So it's really, uh, it's early that the, so survivors were beginning. And I was as soon as we began to talk about the Holocaust. 
And another a part of me, just a small part of me, wonders: isn't everything known about this all? I mean, there's hard, you know, it felt like a lot had been uh, in Frank, and wasn't everything said already? Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how. That People have told me again and again, there's nothing left to say. Yeah, how I can know. you go on writing? And, 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 and how, how, but yet I remember being inspired by you to, to do the in depth reading and how that, how it's, of course, endless. And yeah. how you worry about the future. What will happen? Is this enough? Is Sandbox legacy enough to, um, to, keep, sort of a, to keep the story from not dying? Is that, is that going to? I mean, the, whole, the war, world was ended 75 years ago, and here I am standing in front of you talking about the Holocaust. And how much longer, when we can no longer have that, that, that immediate, uh, the immediate... See, that's another illusion. Every time I speak, not only about Sam, I'm asked, what will we do after the last survivor dies? My first answer is that the last survivor will never die, because we have thousands and thousands of videotaped right. interviews, and their stories will always be there. Secondly, I'm told again and again that there are almost no survivors left. Well, that's not true. There are over 100,000 Holocaust survivors still living in Israel. And God knows how many are still in it. Most of them were children during the Holocaust, older people, of course. Most of them are dead now. But there'll be years before we lose the last survivor. But you don't need the survivor to know the Holocaust story. You do need their testimonies. But we have their testimonies. <laughs> Well, more people, well, most people respect. Thank God the Holocaust deniers are dying out. There are not too many left anymore. And, and very few people will risk saying there never was a gas chamber. There's so much evidence. We have the blue, in the, after um, the Soviet Union fell apart, they found in the archives in Moscow the blueprints for the gas chambers in Auschwitz. Various stages that the designs went through. How thick do you have to make a crematorium chimney so it will bear maximum heat without exploding? How many people can be burned in one? In one? So they have all that. They have visual evidence. And there are hundreds of testimonies. You have testimonies from members of the Zonderkommando, the last work there detail in Auschwitz that took the bodies from the gas chamber to the crematorium. So it's virtually impossible to say to be taken seriously by anyone when someone says there never was a gas chamber. Yeah, Last I don't, question. I don't have a question. I have a statement. My wife and me, we are from the only ones in this audience that we are children of Holocaust survivors. My mother is still living. She's 96 in Israel. And this answering the question of yeah. the gentleman that said before that the United States nobody talked to 1970s, America wasn't ready to talk about it after the way they behaved with the Jews during the, the Holocaust because they could have helped more than other countries. They had the capacity, they had the money, but they simply closed the gate to the United States. Very few Jews came to the United States in that period of time. Yes. And that's the reason that somehow coming from all the way top, it was hush-hush. If we don't talk about it, we don't have to revisit re the history. By 70s, some of those people went away, as the Holocaust denies, you mentioned they are dying out, and new people grew up, and they say, okay, let's talk about this story. And that's what happened. Not that America wasn't talking about it. Right. But so you're talking about your experience, and I honor your experience. The problem with some people, not you, but some people like to say that the experience for all Holocaust survivors was similar or alike. And that's not true. No, no. That's not what one, they're saying. No. Some people I interview say they never talk about it to their children. And some of them say they never stop talking about it to their children. And both are true for a variety of reasons. 